Directions for innovation. Now, we saw in the earlier lesson this idea of different distance in our innovation journey, from incremental innovation, doing what we do better, right the way through to radical innovation, doing something different. And as we saw, we can position ourselves anywhere on that spectrum. So that gives us quite a lot to work with in thinking about our innovation journey. But when we think about innovation, we might also want to think about how we might choose the direction in which to go. And classically, if we were going on a real journey, we'd want some kind of navigation aid. Perhaps these days GPS on the phone, but one of the most reliable devices is the good old-fashioned compass, because it gives us north, south, east and west a way of navigating space. So let's take this analogy, an innovation compass, and try and think about where we could innovate, where we might find opportunities. And the first thing we can think about if we take our compass is that we could change our product, what we offer the world. It might be a real physical product, it might be a service, it might be some combination, but it's changing what we offer the world. And we can change that anywhere on our spectrum from incremental to radical. So some examples. Well, the Bic Crystal Ballpoint Pen. Now that's an interesting one. It's still around today, but it's getting on. It's well past its 70th birthday. It was originally a radical innovation, the world's first mass market, mass produced ballpoint pen. And it's gone through a great deal of incremental improvement, doing what we do better, to what we have today. It's still going strong and it's still doing very well for the big company. It sells around 12 million every day. Or the bicycle. Now that one's over 200 years old. Uh, it's gone through changes. The original bone shakers and penny farthings and other things that characterized the early part of the 19th century, eventually giving away to what we now recognize the diamond frame, which is what we've called the dominant design and has been with us from about the late 19th century. Essentially, lots of incremental improvements and periodically some more radical changes. Or take iTunes. Now, iTunes, or particularly the iPod, which Apple introduced, wasn't the world's first MP3 player, but essentially what it did, first of all in that product, and then later on in the system around it, was fundamentally change the way we consumed music. Particularly, it gave us the chance to store and retrieve and listen to and enjoy music, but it also, behind the scenes, involved setting up a complicated system, iTunes, which managed the royalties and distribution and other things. All examples of product innovation. Plenty of space for innovation. But of course, we can also change our process, the ways we create and deliver whatever it is we offer the world. Same reasons as before, same principle as before, we can do that along our spectrum from incremental right the way through to radical. Again, some examples. Think about what Amazon's done to retailing. First of all, in the area of books, and then moving across gradually into many, many other spaces, fundamentally changing the process from one which was essentially we go to the shop through to online retailing as we know it today. Toyota, car maker for quite a long time, but Toyota's big claim to fame isn't so much the models it produces, its product innovation. Toyota's really big claim to fame is that it fundamentally changed the way we make cars, the process. In post-war Japan, things were very difficult. Resources were very scarce in terms of materials and skilled labor. It was necessary to rethink how we made cars. And Toyota and other firms pioneered an approach which later became known as lean manufacturing, essentially low waste manufacturing, a process innovation which changed the face of manufacturing and increasingly services and the public sector. And the two gentlemen over on the right, they're essentially people we've already met. Alistair Pilkington, the man behind the float glass process, and Dr. Venkataswamy, the man behind the Aravind eye care system. And the Aravind system essentially was a change not in the operation, but in all the other things that were involved in the process of treating cataracts. So again, all examples of process innovation which demonstrate the rich opportunities in that space. There's a third way we can innovate. We can change our position. 
who we offer our product or our service to, and the story we tell them about it. So this is very much the marketing side of innovation, but it's very much about where and how we position our innovation into the minds and the lives of the people we're trying to sell it to. Again, same spectrum from incremental to radical, and again, some examples. If you think about what Starbucks did, they didn't invent coffee, but they repositioned coffee away from being just a drink, a nice hot drink, a commodity, to something which we'd pay quite a lot of money for, available in all sorts of varieties, in an experience about going to the coffee shop that in some ways reminds us of the very earliest days of coffee shops back in the 17th century. It's a very different positioning of a product and a process which have been around a long time. Henry Ford wasn't the first car maker. What Henry Ford did was position the car away from a small luxury market, which only wealthy people could play in, through to being something that was essentially offering a car for every man at a price every man can afford. Or one you may not have heard of, M-Pesa. Now, M-Pesa is a Swahili word, and it really means mobile money. And the idea of M-Pesa, it's something which grew up originally in Kenya, but has diffused widely across Africa and now much further around the world. Its origins were essentially position innovation. It was a partnership between the British Ministry of Overseas Development and the Vodafone company in South Africa, Safaricom. And essentially it was pioneering the use of a mobile phone to send credits. Now that's something we can do with a phone to recharge our, our, our accounts, but you can also use that facility to effectively move money. You can pay for things, you can move things around. You can offer a banking system, a financial services system. And for a country like Kenya, where very few people had access to traditional banking and financial services, this revolutionized things. It made it possible to move money around and engage in all sorts of financial transactions across the platform of a mobile phone. It's interesting how much impact that's had. Something like 50% of the gross domestic product of Kenya now flows across the M-Pesa platform. So it's been a radical innovation in terms of position, moving the experience of money from one position, one world where only the wealthy, only the experienced could use it, to one where many people who would not access this were able to have access. Examples of position innovation. And the last way we can innovate, uh, and I'm stretching a point here, is by changing our paradigm. Now you can see what I've done here. I've tried to use the letter P to start all of these, just to help remember it, the four P's of our compass. Paradigm, though, let me explain, is a Greek word. And what it really means is the mental model we have about our world. Our business model, the way we approach it, it's like the mental spectacles we use in looking at the way our organization creates value for its customers. Now, we can change that. It's a little more difficult because it's like changing your personality. But we can change it, and organizations do, to very good effect. Paradigm innovation is powerful. Again, some examples. If you think about Airbnb, it's now by far and away the biggest provider of accommodation in the world, but it doesn't own a single room. It's essentially changed the model, taken the very old model of we need to provide accommodation for people, which has been with us for centuries, but meld that with the idea of couch surfing and being in the sharing economy to offer a very different approach. It's rethought the way it can create value. Spotify and the various other streaming services, again, do we really need to own the music we like to listen to? Now, what Spotify and the streaming services do is say, no, why not rent it? And we'll make available a vast choice. I have access to millions of songs. I haven't got enough lifetime to listen to everything available to me. I don't own a single track. That's the opportunity that Spotify and others have opened up by effectively changing the paradigm, changing the underlying model. And big capital equipment people, people like Rolls-Royce who sell aircraft engines or Caterpillar with their huge earth moving things, they no longer sell the product, they rent the functionality. If you're an airline, you don't want an engine, you want to keep your plane in the air. So why not rent power by the hour, which is what Rolls-Royce and General Electric now offer. It's changed the way they approach their business. 
And of course, this opens up interesting space. For a very long time, you might think of the, the soft drink wars between Coca-Cola and Pepsi as being one in which generally Coca-Cola is the lead player and Pepsi the second. But actually, Pepsi does rather well because it reframed the way it thought about what it does to being offering the, uh, the snack experience, that as well as the soft drink you're drinking, you want to nibble something with it. And Pepsi has grown a huge business around snack foods. So there's plenty of space around changing the way we approach what we do, paradigm innovation. So if you think about these four Ps as the points on a compass, we can innovate in any of those directions and, of course, anywhere in the space in between. Just like on a real compass, you can have north, south, east and west. You can have north, northwest or south, southeast and so on. Plenty of directions to move and we can move incrementally, doing what we do better or radically. One last point, changing one dimension may well force us to change in other directions. Think about the low-cost airline world. Now, low-cost airlines have been with us quite a long time, but they fundamentally changed the game of flying from something which was big airlines flying into big cities and very much a, a, a safe, quite profitable business. The low-cost airlines changed that. They began with position innovation. Their question was, who doesn't fly yet, but might? Well, actually, lots of people might fly if they could. Students love to travel, but they haven't got much money. Grandma would love to go and visit the grandkids, but can only afford the bus fare. So what if we could make low-cost safe flying available? Great idea, position innovation. But to make it happen, of course, unless you want to go bankrupt very quickly, it's not just about offering low price seats. It's about changing your processes. Think about the check-in, the turnaround of the aeroplanes and many other things. That's been revolutionized. And it's about changing the product. A few simple short haul destinations, not offering the huge spectrum of worldwide travel. Essentially, what happens with low cost airlines demonstrates that if you change one thing, position innovation, it's going to drive change in the others. And eventually it becomes the dominant business model, the way all airlines have to think. So let's summarize where we are in this film. Innovation direction matters. It's not just a case of, wow, we've got 360 degrees of choice. Where should we go? We can't afford that. There are plenty of opportunities in our four key directions, product, process, position or paradigm, and plenty of opportunities within there for incremental as well as radical change. And innovating in one direction will often drive innovation in other directions to make that fundamental change actually work.